here on this lovely Thursday night. Um, my name is Joe Perry. I'm the wine buyer here um, at the Oak Barrel. Um, have been for the last three years. I'm responsible for all of the good and bad decisions that are made uh, in the Oak Barrel's uh, wine space. Um, uh, for, for those of you that probably aren't too familiar with the Oak Barrel, um, we're a small independent bottle store based here in Sydney CBD. Um, 100% independent across wine, spirits, beers, and, and all the rest. And uh, we are very, very passionate about what we do and, and are passionate about running events. Um, people that may have set foot in the Oak Barrel before would have seen the um, events room tasting space out the back where we would run um, quite often a, a range of wine tastings based around um, different themes, different countries, different regions, different styles, and all the rest. But unfortunately, due to... Um, Something that has happened this year rendered us uh, slightly unable to uh, fill the, the tasting room full of um, budding wine lovers alike. So quickly, we um, we sort of switched it up a little bit and uh, we've um, developed a, a way to bring the, hopefully bring the Oak Barrel wine tasting experience uh, to you in, in your lounge room or your, or your house or wherever you may be. And that's um, been ever really, really popular and we've received some, some amazing support um, via doing these wine tastings. And I have to say they are, have been a lot, a lot of fun. Um, but so that's, uh, for those of you that did sort of purchase a, a tasting kit with us tonight, um, we are going to be diving into um, one of my all time favorite regions. Um, and one of the regions that interests me the most out of, I think almost every European region. Um, we would have bought two wines uh, from, from us here that have been shipped out to you, one white, one red um, from the, um, uh, Italian island of Sicily, um, and I think it's I think it's fair to say a little bit that it really, to me, feels like Sicily has almost exploded in the last sort of five years from not really getting much access to to, to much wine from that region to shelves and shelves full. Uh, the, the 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 whole Etna thing has been massive. Just seeing um, some incredible wines coming over. The the drinkability, the freshness, the the aromatic styles of these wines is has really um, impressed me and, and kept my fascination for, for several years now. And I know it's doing the same for, for everybody across Australia and the globe. Um, so you can imagine my excitement when I did have the chance to run a, a Sicilian virtual wine tasting and send out some awesome um, little wines for you guys to taste along. Um, unfortunately, there is um, no way that I would ever see myself knowledgeable enough to sit here and, and, and talk you guys through Sicilian wines. So um I was very, very lucky to enlist the help of uh, my friend Paolo Sandri up in up on the Sunshine Coast there, um, who is far more knowledgeable um, and far more Italian than I am to, to sort of speak on this topic. So, Paolo, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Joe. And thank you for having me tonight. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm the deal. I'm the real, right? I'm the, I'm, <laughs> I'm the one from there. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, for me to introduce these uh, these family and these wines from that beautiful island of, of Sicily. As probably nobody uh, knows, Sicily has a climate which is very close to the Australian climate, very warm, mild. Um, in winter, the, the excursion between day and night is not huge, a part of in a couple of areas like in the um, Eastern side of the of the island uh, on the volcano on the Etna area. Uh, all the rest of the island has a very mild climate through through the year, um, and this is shown into uh, the varietal that they grow in there and to the wines that they've been produced. And with you saying when you say that in the last ten years it's been a, a, a boom uh, into the Australian market with the uh, Sicilian uh, wines, especially from Etna. Uh, tonight we're going to taste a couple of, uh, of gems that they come from the other side of the island. So you're going to the uh, western side of the island towards Palermo. Um, the triangle there is between Palermo, um, Salemi and, and Trapani. Um, and we are going to taste uh, two uh, white varietals blended in the Gatto Bianco and one ancient varietal uh, called Terricone um, in, the, in the Fontana dei Grilli. Yeah, I think um, that's, I think, what, what sort of piqued my interest the most when you, you, you sort of uh, presented these wines to me. And I always, like I said, I was very, very keen to get a, a Sicilian wine tasting off the ground. And 
you know, we, we sort of touched on earlier, we could have done, you know, straight Grillo, straight Nero Davila and sort of done it like that. I think that's where, you know, a lot of the entry level sort of um, Sicilian wines come in and that's, that's, a, that's a good sort of, I guess, base point. But um, even more interesting, I think that the two that you've, you've presented from the same producer um, is it, it, sort of, I, I, I think might really encompass a, a little bit more of what Sicily's about in terms of that up, ancient up. variety of what you touched on and maybe not just so much about being just Etna, but if Etna is what gets people into it, it's almost like it, it's a little bit, you know, Burgundy-esque and just how unique all the microclimates are across the island. Absolutely. Um, to everyone tuning in on Facebook and Zoom, uh, we are uh, totally happy to hear any comments and questions throughout the night as well. Please um, go through. But yeah, so what, what, what was it that sort of drew you to, to, the, to these wines specifically and to Sicily in the first place? Okay, when I first started my, my company, um, I touched base with, uh, with friends. So I moved here in Australia um, 10 years ago when I was 41. So I had already a bit of experience in the wine industry when I started. I started when I was 19. Um, became a certified sommelier from the Italian Association and slowly, uh, you know, moving, uh, helping to write uh, wine list and working as a consultant uh, for hotels and, and, and uh, retails, um, bottle shops. In Italy, it works a bit different, but, you know, just to cut short the story, I made a lot of friends. And through these friends, uh, I had the privilege to to have the Funaro family. I couldn't start, I couldn't start my company without them. That's the, the reality. Um, Funaro is a very small uh, winery in Sicily. Uh, they, they've got a very small production, but they've been rewarded in the, in the last years uh, with, with top ranking uh, points. The overall comments on the on the production of of the Funaro family is, is always overwhelming. Um, it's run from three siblings, um, so we we starting from uh, uh, my pa, uh, as most of the wineries in Italy on a, as a family business uh, model. The, the parents in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, they were growing the, uh, the grapes to sell it to the, the, big, the big names, the big boys oh, in the area where, you know, the new generation coming along, they started to say, oh, look, yeah, we can continue to do that, but maybe we can start our own label. We can start our own winery. We can, we can do something different. And the aim of the Funaro has always been... Um, focus on, 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 on motherland. So there, for example, their motto is, uh, we start from the ground every day. So they look after the soil to, before thinking about the cash, thinking about the money. The company in 2011, so this, they started in 2003 with the Funaro label. In 2011, the company was certified organic and eco-friendly so eco sustainability for them is a big is a big issue so what they're doing for example they're trying to reuse the waste until the waste is unreusable so it's packed to the minimal essence for for the for the tip uh, from everything that they use in the in the winery to everything that they use in the fields um, and they, they are not just wine growers, or, you know, they, they, they're not just wine makers. They grow uh, half, of the, half of the actors that they own is planted with uh, Nocellara del Belice olives. They produce this beautiful green gold, uh, thick, viscous, luscious, extra virgin olive oil. Those notes of white pepper, they still on my palate when I, when I think about it. So, uh, again, the project of the winery started in 2003. The three siblings are Tiziana, uh, Clemente, and Giacomo. Tiziana look after the uh, admin paperwork and, and the money. She is the smart one. <laughs> Clemente is the, uh, the, the, the person that um, promotes the philosophy of the company, so is the one that goes overseas. 
on the on the trade fairs is always there in you know for uh, tasting the wines and and talk about the the philosophy of the company and uh, last but not least is uh, Giacomo Giacomino Giacomo is the team leader in the in the winery uh, he looks after the 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 vines with a very tidy team and the, the team is uh, with them since they started. So every single element of, of his team has, has practically seen the, the, the Funaro uh, when, since, since, since the Funaro was born. So they, it's a family team. Um, everything uh, is being uh, planted in between Trapani, Salemi, and Santa Ninfa. So the winery is sitting most of the the, the sorry the of the um, of the the vines are planted between 150 to 450 uh, meters above the sea level, which is already a good height uh, for a good altitude for uh, for that uh, uh, that that part of, of Sicily. We're not going towards you know the other side, where is more Rocky Mountain, and you got the Etna. So altitude there is is probably double um so everything is harvested by hand um everything is harvested uh um, and selected by hand uh from every single vineyard uh they've got a couple of uh, vineyards with international varietal um they produce a beautiful uh, sparkling uh, base with chardonnay um which I do not import because the fight here is between the Prosecco and the Champagne. <laughs> so, but yeah, everything is very, is looked after very, very, very well in every single uh, detail and aspect of, of uh, the production from this, you know, from, from scratch, from start to the end. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And you said, you said that obviously um, sort of 50 years ago when I guess Sicily was a little bit more old school and, and there were people that were selling grapes or selling uh, uh, wine to the, the larger companies. Now that there's a, a, a younger generation, I guess, staying or moving back to Sicily and then sort of taking back these these old vineyards um, and starting to manage them, like you said, handpicking, organically farming, um, treating it like that. Is that... Is that like quite a big deal still, or is it, is it, is it very much still really tiny little? No, know, no, in Italy, people it, here or? in Italy, I will say that a good seventy uh, percent of of the so Italy has been built up on small companies, on uh, artisans. Everything is if you look into every single aspect of the Italian industry, the Italian industry is very small. Everything is based on uh, on artisans or um, people that has. Uh, manual skills. Um, there has been in the f uh, in between the 50 and the 70s a lot of people that has moved, has uh, expatriated. I've done it later, but for different reason. I, I I married a an Aussie girl, so it was like to pay back after 15 years living in Italy and having grown a family with three kids. Um, and we've done it with good results. We're very happy for what we we've done. But anyway. This is uh, something that uh, has happened in Italy uh, now in the last probably 20 years. A lot of young people has come back after uh, different, um, uh, I don't know, choice of life. You know, you, you, the, the countryside is being repopulated from, uh, from people that has decided to come back. Coming back to do something that they thought it was in the beginning not worth the the life to stay, and when they came back, they started to say, "No, that's what we want." Um, and again, the Italian wine industry, it has yes, 20, 30, 40 has 20, 30, 40 groups, very big, uh, with the production of millions of bottles in a year, because they they buy from every single small one, but 70% of of the wineries are family-owned businesses so looking after your land looking after your your results you know your plants uh, you, you you don't poison the land that gives you the fruit 
you look after that land. You, 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 you like, it's like growing roses. You have to talk to the roses. That's what they say, my nonna. My nonna always said to me, you have to talk to the flowers if you want the flowers to blossom. And that's what people is doing now. It's a bit poetic, but it's, it's the truth because Italy is a small country, uh, very... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Population is too much. Probably we're talking about 65 million people living in a in a strip of land that goes from Sydney to Melbourne, uh, <laughs> and uh, east to west in the broader side of the Alps is 350 k's. In the narrow side uh, towards the central of Italy is uh, 95 k's. So it is a very small piece of land. England is the same. Um, so probably English people can understand what I'm talking when I said we are over overcrowded people who is living on top of each elbows every day. So uh, yeah, but a lot of people has come back. A lot of young generation, say people in the mid, in the mid, between the mid thirties and the mid forties came back with ideas. And now they've got, you know, kids following uh, that kind of path. And uh, the, the wine industry is, is taking advantage of that and the results are coming along in the last, I would say in the last 15 years, I think uh, the Italian uh, wine market has, has gained great results. Uh, and organic farming is the key. Uh, mm. Some, they embrace uh, biodynamic production too. So it's a bit of a, the, the, a, bit of a, a different path, uh, but always, thinking that you can't produce in by you know any wine a biodynamic wine without growing organically your your farm your fruit so that's i would say yes so they're coming back and there is a movement that is not stopping it is a movement that is going along and is going along quite well yeah awesome i think it's yeah i feel like that's it's notable in the wines we see being bought over but it's also interesting at the very start you sort of drew a bit of a comparison between the wines of Sicily and how that uh, translates to an Australian palette and I do think there's a little bit of that similar similar to what you just discussed happening here in Australia too which is very exciting and just, just globally really if, if anything yeah yeah I, I think is a it, there is a you know the movement of the slow slow food has has uh, shaken the tree so uh, <laughs> and now we you know I have to say that possibly this uh, situation with the COVID-19, so the pandemic, which has uh, given to us probably the, the, it's not a choice, but we had to live in slower uh, than what we were doing before. The lockdown has kept us in contact with our, uh, with, with our uh, family members and the life doesn't have to run. We don't have to, we don't have to run every day for everything. There are days that you have to be very active and other days that maybe you can slow it down and take it easy and look after yourself or your, or your, your, you know, your family. I'm talking about family because I've got three kids and, you know, I've got three teenagers and a wife and a dog. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to be, I have to be very diligent. <laughs> Um, well, I might try a glass of this this first wine, the white. As I'm, sure. I'm sure most I'm sure most people uh, view, viewing along with us in Zoom might already have a full glass of wine, but um, I'm going to try the well, white. Sorry for the one that, that doesn't have anything. <laughs> in it, but I will try to to uh, take you through uh, mm. this beautiful uh, juice. So the blend. So the name is uh, Gatto Bianco, the White Cat. Um, is the vintage 2018. It is a blend 50-50 between Inzolia and Zibibo. So two indigenous uh, autochthon varietals of, of Sicily. Um, when I take through the Inzolia, usually I explain the Inzolia because it's a bit of a semi-aromatic varietal. I'll take through the Inzolia um, like, uh, it, it is like a, it drinks like a Pinot Gris. Put it in that way. So he's got beaut. Is 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 soft. Is warm. Um, is uh, is rounded. Um, but he's got acidity. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't give you that candy. Uh, it's not. Doesn't have an, an overwhelming flavor 
of taste of, of candied um, mango or pawpaw. Um, the other 50% instead is the essence of Sicily. Zibibo is, you know, is what I said always, you are drinking a, so it, it is like having a Sicilian cannolo in the glass. Zibibo is warm, round, uh, orange peel, apricot, that beautiful smell of the, the ricotta baked that goes into the cannoli. That's what is the Zibibo. Usually is used for a, a sweet wine, dessert wine. Uh, so it's got a bit of viscosity. It's quite alcoholic, but cut it with the, the inzolia in this, in this uh, blend. He's showcasing the nose uh, and the first palate with these notes without being too, uh, without overwhelming, without taking over the inzolia. The wine in this case finishes very mineral, very dry, um, but he's, uh, he's very feminine. He's, he's, se he's, he's a sexy wine because it's, it's so soft and round uh, that he gives you the, the, the time to think, okay, I can match it with so much. You know, every single white flesh talking about bugs, langoustine, without going to, uh, or, uh, too far to achieve the, the lobster, but it is a wine that it will uh, uh, help you with this kind of, uh, of seafood. Um, but you can drink it itself without uh, having anything on the side. It's, it's a wine that you can uh, maybe nibble with a bit of uh, salty nibble, so you can you know cut through uh, uh, that kind of um, salinity and saltiness through you know the sweetness initial sweetness from the zibibo uh but is a is a wine that has a good complexity um and a good structure um i would say something that can be uh so people that drinks uh pinot gris or uh, some of the uh, sauvignon blancs not all of them but some some production of sauvignon blanc can be uh uh, put close to, to this uh, wine, can swap uh, and can uh, take along to drink uh, a wine like this. Mm. And so, what do you, what do you, do you know? I, I was, I'm like, when I first opened this, probably about uh, half an hour ago now or something, I just initially out of the bottle, just that big lift, that big, um, you know, I, like, Turkish delight was one of those things yeah. that we alluded to Absolutely. a little bit, which. Yeah. It's a very common um, tasty note that I use for things like Gewürztraminer and yeah. those sorts of aromatic European varietals yeah. as well. Um, we definitely, I know we do see a little bit of Zabibo or I think musket here, it's often um, used as as well. Um, and that I that is a native Italian varietal, a native Sicilian varietal, or are both Zibibo. of these native to, to, to oh, Sicily? Zibibo. Zibibo is what we call uh, Muscat from Alexandria, Alexandria mm -hmm. from mm. Egypt. So yeah, okay. yep, yep. Is, is, a, is an Egyptian variety. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sicily, Sicily, like a lot of other uh, regions in Italy, has been invited in, uh, in, the, in the past centuries, in the past, you know, uh, from many and many different uh, uh, populations. So we're talking about the Egyptians, which they were trading if you know Sicily is not too far away from Morocco and Egypt and mm. Tunisia. If you look at the island of Pantelleria, the island of Pantelleria is more closer to the African borders than not to the Italian, to, to, to Sicily itself. Yeah, right. So um, uh, Sicily has the invasion of the Ottomans, so from the Turkish. Sicily, Sicily has been invaded uh, or is the 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 has different culture in, in you know, 2000, uh, 3000 years ago, 2000 years ago, going backwards to, to the, the, the beginning of the history of Sicily, you've got so many um, different uh, community that they are crossed through. Uh, on the Western side of, 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 uh, of Sicily, sorry, on the Eastern side of Sicily, 
you got uh, La Valle dei Templi, so the, the Valley of the Temples, that is completely Greek. You got a second Parthenon built up in, in that area. Um, so through the, the centuries, uh, the island has been invaded from many and many other different um, uh, culture and, and populations. Uh, so the Greek, they came through Puglia, they across Puglia to go through Calabria and went through Sicily. So, but they left the imprint in, in Agrigento where the Valle dei Templi is. So where you got the, the copy of the Parthenon, which is just a smaller copy of the Parthenon that is in, in Athens. Um, it's, it's very, it's very, um, uh, I love to talk about this because Italy is, is, a, is a country under one flag since uh, 1870. So we are a republic, but before we were land of, <laughs> of conquest, you know, we had the Austrian and Hungarian empire from uh, the, the, the northern side. So you, you think about Friuli. Uh, so Friuli, Venezia Giulia, so Friuli was just connected to Yugoslav. Uh, the area of, uh, of Alto Adige coming down to Trentino and Lombardy and Veneto, that was part of the Austrian and Hungarian empire. Piedmont. It, it was just, Piedmont is on the other side of the French Alps. So when Napoleon started the invasion of Italy, he came through there. So that's why in Piedmont, we got the DOC P, Pinot Noir. So we got a Pinot Noir DOC in, uh, in Piedmont. Uh, that's why the best Chardonnays from Italy, they come from Piedmont. Uh, because that was French land. So Valle d'Aosta, they still speak in French. Where in, in Alto Adige, they still speak in German, speak in German. So every single um, uh, sign on the street is in Italian and German. And that's Alto Adige. So Bolzano is called Bosen. Uh, Merano is called Meran. It's that, so every single uh, little part of that area is uh, bilingual. Uh, they speak more German, they're not Italian. Uh, on the other side, in Valle d'Aosta, they speak more French than Italian. So you got variety in Valle d'Aosta called Petit d'Arven. Uh, <laughs> they French names for, for French varietals grown in Italy. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, see, uh, Napoli, Campania, uh, Lazio with Rome, that area was part of the, uh, uh, the, the Spanish Empire the family of the Borboni, the Borbons, they were Spanish. And this was the biggest family uh, in, in Spain, in, in, in Napoli, sorry, in, in uh, Campania. Ferdinando II was uh, related to that family. So there is, uh, uh, you know, you cannot talk about Italy without touching base and link regions to other cultures. Mm. Milano, uh, the, the national dish of Milano, the city where I come from, Cotoletta la Milanese is a schnitzel. <laughs> schnitzel comes from Germany. Yeah. And that's what we eat. The bacon ricotta comes from Africa. Doesn't come from Sicily. Mm. The, 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 can, the, the way of candying or uh, to do uh, candy peel with oranges, with mandarins, with lemons, and things like that from Sicily comes from Africa. Mm. Um, Sardinia was, there is a, a specific town, Carlo Forte in Sardinia, where they're still speaking Catalan. Yeah, right. so the dialect of, or the language, because if you, say, if you talk about dialect with this, in, the, in, this, in this situation, it's completely wrong, it's a language. So if you take someone from Barcelona and sit them there or vice versa, they can speak. One is speaking his language, the other one is speaking his language because Catalan is not Spanish. Don't say to that to Barcelona people, otherwise they will kill you. But anyway, they can understand each other because the invasion of the Spanish in Sardinia has been so, uh, so big and, and the culture of the Spanish was so deep into the tissue of the population in Sardinia that they're still speaking the same languages. Carignan grows in Sardinia and grows in Spain. Grenache, which is the Grenaja, comes from Spain and across the Pyrenees goes in France. 
so there are so many varietals uh, that they've been grown in different regions due to the different invasions. It's quite well, interesting. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I've never really even considered that um, that African influence on, on Sicily, Absolutely. or I even knew that it, it was even there. And then seeing obviously Zabibo coming in and, and um, like you said, the, the um, effect that it has on the, the cuisine and, and then the, 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 the life in, in general is amazingly interesting. Um, the other question I did have about this wine um, was that something that um, I think gets a lot of people into, uh, into Sicily is, is Etna. And what's talked about a lot in Sicily and in Etna in general is the the, uh, the volcanic soils that come obviously yes. off that mountain. But here would I think you mentioned at the start we're talking about the other side near Palermo. Yeah. Yes. What is it like climatically in terms of soil topography and climate so the in soil, general differing from yeah, say the it's other completely side? different. So on the on the um, western side of the so eastern side of the island is the the, the volcano. So the lava soil is what is. Uh, uh, giving the um, essence to the wines. Uh, so very, very mineral, uh, very uh, sulfurous wines. On the other side, you've got a lot of uh, chalk and clay. So for example, the, the, the vineyards in, uh, in, in that area between Salemi and, uh, and Santa Ninfa, uh, they got a 70% of clay underneath. So for example, Funaro doesn't need to to um, to water the the vineyards very often because, as you know, the clay has a good retention of water and has a good retention of the humidity. Uh, again, the 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 in between the night and the day, a part of a specific period, there's not a lot of uh, there's not a big excursion. But anyway, the because it's so hot through the day. A lot of humidity goes through the goes through the soil goes goes through the ground. So the clay retain that that sweat and that water, and the plants they don't need to they don't need to be watered from uh, from uh, anyone. In this way, there is a natural selection of of the vines. Uh, the vines they see, for example, in uh, in the in the Etna uh, region. Uh, growing on on a lava soil, so on a rock hard soil, uh, the nutrients they get through these cracks into into the soil, into the lava. So the 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 roots they have to grow very deep and very uh, uh, a part of each other to to get this nutrient, to get this water. So they fight each other for survival and. It, it's normal that when you've got a, a, a kind of situation like that, you, uh, the grapes, they grow low he, yield, but very high in quality. That's why most of the wines that they come from that area, they are in quality very high. But the production is small, so that's why the high prices. Uh, where on the other side of the island, uh, not having that problem, it's much more easier to grow and to get more uh, fruit from uh, from the from the vineyards, uh, the bunch is not very small or slim. You know, Nerello Mascarese grows not; uh, they're not big bunches. It's, it's growing like a Pinot Noir, so probably 600, 700 grams or per bunch. Where you go into the other side, you've got a kilo, a kilo two hundred, a kilo three hundred bunch of fruit, and is is there is a lot of difference. The concentration in in Etna is much more. Uh, where the, on the other side is 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 less, but it, it, on it, on the other side of the of the coin, uh, you can grow different varietals, and they can give you a different a different aspect, uh, so a different quality um, mm. uh, in in the glass. Uh, they always high quality wines. Um, I'm not saying that Edna is better than the other side or vice versa. They two different. They completely different um, uh, areas. Mm. Yeah, it is. Isn't it interesting that that variation across such a small, small yeah. island? I guess, but like it I is. said, cl climatically, it's, it, it, I, I find it fascinating. The length of the island is three hundred and fifty kilometers. Yeah. So you're talking about the the length of uh, Sunshine Coast from Calandria mm. to Impi. <laughs> it's yeah. Three hundred k's. So 
that's that's Sicily, and it's got so much diversity because of the soil, because of of the ground. Absolutely, yes, and yeah. that's why they grow different varieties too. But yeah, I've just been I've been following this this wine opening up in the glass. There, it just seems to get almost more aromatic. Like it just seems to get a little bit more broad and more yeah. and richer, and still keeping that lovely, um, not intrusive but quite prominent acid, acid line right through the middle. Yeah, super that, interesting. That, that's the insolia. Otherwise, mm. you know, I'm not saying that you, the the straight Zibibo production in dry style is not a good wine. Absolutely not. But you need to be very into that kind of flavors because Zibibo can be very very uh, broad and big but mm. sweet too. So I think Zibibo needs to be cut um, with some grapes, in this case, the Inzolia, it works perfectly, with a very high vein of acidity. So that vein, it stays in the middle of your palate. He allows you to enjoy the, 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 what the Zibibo uh, uh, takes along, but it doesn't give you that uh, overwhelming sensation where you said, okay, it's like having a, a chopper chops in your mouth that you could mm. suck sugar. It's it's different, you know. It, otherwise, it will be very very uh, like a, a glass of wine, and that's it. You can't finish a, a bottle in two. It's it will be it will be a shame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've certainly seen takes on Zavivo from like across the, across the globe, but like you say, get very. I I'd use the word flabby a little bit, mm. just without having any of that structure, and there's just yeah. full of flavors going left, right, and center without any any structure. Um, so with this being my first experience with Inzolia as a variety, I guess I'm putting that in the, that's, that really stiffens it up. Like you said, drinks a bit like a Pinot Gris. Um, and then, yeah, just sort of adds that backbone to the wine. But I really like this. I think Good. it's awesome. Good. Like, I, it. Yeah. I hope the customers would like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. I know my customers pretty well. And, and this is, um, I get just I, another one of those, well, you're seeing these sorts of wines, these sorts of varieties, these aromatic varieties really gaining popularity now because, like we touched on earlier, the versatility with a whole, like a plethora of different foods. See, um, this, this is perfect, for example, mm. with uh, spicy, um, uh, you know, uh, Thai food. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes along with curries. Uh, maybe you have to go with more with... Uh, curries from Sri Lanka where you burn mm. your spices and not maybe with the Indian that they more uh, deeper in, in flavor, you know, but mm. it will go along with a different, different kind of cuisine. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, all right. I think it might be time to duck into the red. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Just trying to put that down. I get another, another first for um, varieties for me here as well. This one. Not something that, you see every day. This for me is uh, is great because um, you know we could, as you said in the beginning, we could take you know everyone on board with an Erodavola and a Grillo, which uh, it would probably embrace a bigger um, uh, a bigger number of, of customers, um, especially with the Erodavola being a very very uh, smart. In, in a good sense uh, as a wine. I, I, I suggested these wines just to give you, just to give a, a bit of a twist to, to this to tonight tasting, just to introduce something that uh, you can be interested uh, or intrigued to, to drink. You don't have to drink these every day. Oh, I would be uh, delighted if people would drink <laughs> these wines every day, but these are wines that you, you need to, you need to know you need to know that there's not just shiraz that can grow everywhere there's not just cabernet that can grow everywhere i'm not if you can pass me this this uh word i'm not bitching mm -hmm. these kind of varieties but there are so many other interesting varieties that can be drank through our life that just sitting on a couple of varieties for 20 years i think is quite boring so I think that um, uh, my job, your job, you know, job of people that has a, a palate which has already tasted hundreds and hundreds of different varieties and different wines has to pass this knowledge to, to everyone. Um, I think people have to embrace, uh, uh, 
you know, differences from culture to whatever. You know, COVID is, is teaching us a lot. Um, everything that is happening in the world is teaching us a lot uh, without going to politics. Sorry, I don't want to do that. But, <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's part of, of the journey of everyone, you know, going and trying different things and not get stuck just in the same of, of every day. So um, this one is a wine that needs to open up a bit. It's a 2016, uh, which has a 15% of wine blended, same variety, uh, from a previous vintage that was sitting in, uh, in old barrel. So practically what they do, they pick up um, usually, uh, I think the harvest has been uh, made in mid-September. Every single variety from Funaro is picked early in the morning or in the night. So they pick through the coolest hours of the 24 hours day, okay? Not just the afternoon. So they pick uh, uh, with the coolest hours because they want to avoid uh, the grapes to start fermentation in the, in the crates. You know, as, as soon, you know, the, the grapes breaks the skin, the fermentation is natural and starts. So they want to avoid that. So usually they use uh, ice, uh, synthetic ice on top of the, the grapes just to keep it cold. Uh, it's a very short uh, drive to, to get to the, to the cellar. Uh, so they, they, they doing this, uh, they working in this way just to avoid uh, that pre pre maceration um, it's a skin content wine 12 days on skin so batonage remouage uh, and after that goes in stainless steel uh, which is stays for nearly one year and when it's ready they blend this 15% uh, of Perricone from the previous vintage that is kept practically for one entire year into old barrels and stays in the, in the bottle of six to eight months before uh, release on the market. Uh, the wine has um, a great history, is an ancient grape, uh, is one of the grapes that is being used for the production of the Marsala Rosso, so the Ruby Marsala in the 800s. Uh, an English uh, gentleman came through Sicily and loved that uh, sweet marsala, uh, but it was too sweet. So he added a bit of alcohol and he produced the marsala to, which everyone knows as sherry. Uh, and it's been a, a, great, uh, uh, a great journey for the Sicilian wineries in that period until everything uh, slipped from hands because they were not looking at the quality anymore, but at the quantity. And that wasn't, uh, and that <laughs> it wasn't a smart move anyway. So the, the Pericone is uh, an ancient grape uh, that grows in the island from since, you know, the early, uh, the early ages of Jesus Christ. So we can talk about more than 2000 years. Um, I need to read this because I got a little note because I couldn't remember uh, properly uh, the, the age. So in, uh, that's it. So the, in, uh, in, uh, in 1870, uh, it was reported as the, the grape of the island. So probably the right grape of the island has always been the Pericone. Um, and the, 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 what happened to this grape is uh, in, in, the, in the last 40, 50 years, it's been all uh, eradicated from, from the ground, from the soil to make space to the Nero Davola and to the other varietals like Cabernet Sauvignon, like uh, other great uh, red varietals that they were more in demand for the market. Um, a lot of a lot few wineries they kept the pericone alive uh, they funaro has always had the pericone on on their production um and now the pericone is is coming back the production of pericone is getting 
Vera uh, is uh, getting more uh, interesting. Um, and I think this will be the way of keeping alive. It's the only way to keeping alive, uh, you know, the ancient grapes or the indigenous grapes of, of every single, every single uh, territory. In this case, the Pericord and Sicily. It's a wine that has suffered the phylloxera. So uh, in the early, or to, from the early to the mid 800s has been, uh, uh, has, you know, it's been, uh, especially because it's a, it, the Pericone is, it, it suffers more than other grapes that the, the Philosera uh, bug. So um, probably uh, two thirds of the, of the vines, they've been, they've been lost after already losing the, 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 the flair to produce the Pericone grape. In that period, the, the Philosera took over probably two thirds of the, of the wineries, of the, of the vines, sorry, planted in, in the island. Uh, but now I think he's, he's coming back uh, properly. Um, he's always been grown in that part of, of Sicily. Uh, Sicily is divided in three major areas. If you look into, if you look into uh, the little three moons, half, you know, quarter moons in, in, the, in the neck of the, the bottle, it is like a triangle. If you if you uh, trace the lines, so you got the top one that is practically the region of Etna, the bottom one is the region of Agrigento, and the left one is the region of of Trapani. So these are the okay. three major region of uh, the island for the production of of the grape. And every one of these region has different grapes grown into into the land. Um, it's 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 quite interesting that uh, Funaro has kept that uh, little little uh, uh, thing alive. And the half moon. What reminds you the half moon? What does it remind me of? Yeah, I don't know. Turkey. The, the country. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They got it into the flag. So the half moon is often used in, uh, in Sicilian design and is from the Ottomans, from the Turkish. Right, okay. Oh, and so yeah. when you touched on, I mean, it did, did obviously suffer that, um, the, the devastating effects of phylloxera, like you said, yeah. the two thirds. Yeah. Um, but because it, it has such a long history on Sicily, does that mean that there is some, some quite, there's some really old vine material for pericone still based Absolutely. on that? Okay. Well, these, these uh, vines are not all the same age, but the oldest part of the vineyards is 55 years old. Yeah, right, okay. So, and, and, and we're talking about Funaro not being one of the oldest winery in, in the area. So I'm, I'm assuming that they, if there is someone that is, is, is probably going along with probably 90, 100 years old uh, vines, maybe, just a row in the in the vineyards, but yeah, absolutely yes. It's like Grenache, probably down in McLaren Bay, mm -hmm. where they got very old old uh, old vines. Cirillo, one of the producers that has got the old vine. Um, I've been in McLaren Bay four years ago, five years ago, and I I I, I was very um, pleased to to see how much uh, effort they put into. Uh, to save and to preserve this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of history of the Australian uh, winemaking uh, industry. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, I've I've tasted a few of the wines that come off the, those vines that you mentioned there, the the older the Centurion vines and the Survivor vines and that kind of thing. And um, the one thing that stood out for me in those wines and that I'm seeing a little bit of here, where you mentioned that even the 55 year old vines is they always have this add this sort of elemental layer of concentration Absolutely. in the fruit. And this, for me, it's so, you know, after the hour or so it's been open, it's really lifted up now. Um, still got a really rustic nose, but it's got quite yeah. this bold, intense core of dark fruit. 
yeah, which I which I was actually quite um, surprised by to see come from Sicily after tasting, you know, the Norella Mascalese, the Nero Davila, which are all very light and medium bodied and really juicy yeah. and crunchy. This is a little bit more in the brooding serious yeah. path. It, it is a more dusty uh, mm. variety, say put it in that way. Um, it's very interesting uh, uh, how the, the name come from because uh, the Pericone has been uh, uh, named and none uh, before being called Pericone is, is being called Pignatello. The Pignate, so the Pignate, the Pignate are practically the, the, the terracotta jars that you use at the table, like your, 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 your plate for your, for your everyday meal. And in that area, that land of terracotta for the clay is, 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 is practically the highlight of, of, uh, of the colors of that piece of land. So uh, from Pignatello to Pericone, I don't know how they've been changed or why they have changed through the, through the years. But yeah, in the, in the early uh, 800s, the, the variety was called, was uh, named and, and, and known as Pignatello because of those pignate, because of this uh, uh, land of clay. So they were practically producing the, the everyday dish where they're eating uh, the everyday food from, from that. And that's because it was growing in that area on top of that clay, it, it was being named uh, pignatello. So it is, everything has a bit of a, a interesting history. Sicily is an ancient, an ancient island with an ancient history. And uh, <laughs> it's very, it's very, uh, I think it's not, it's, it's not been discovered yet. Um, I've got a great friend that now is in Sicily and he's, he does his trip every year. Um, he's, a, he's probably the godfather, one of the godfather of the Italian cuisine here in, uh, in Australia. And he lives in your city, he's Stefano Manfredi. Mm. Uh, so Stefano is now in Sicily and he's one of the, the one that likes to to take all the little secrets back from from the island. Um, we got a great relationship. Um, and we talk about the, uh, you know the island and Sicily, the culture and the food and the wine more uh, often. And uh, it's it's very it's something that I think we should uh, be able to to pass to uh, uh, our customers. Um, not just Sicily. I'm talking about in general. So Italy is, is made with you know we got 20 regions that, that they, we speak 20 different dialects. Sometimes <laughs> in the same region there are four or five different dialects. My mom she she she's from Sardinia, and from one town to the other we're talking about 25 guys. They speak two different dialects. <laughs> they 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 pronounce the words in a different way, and they say you know how come this can happen, you know? and they still keeping alive this beautiful uh, dialect and history of, of, of the land through, you know, the recipes, through the production of the wines, through, uh, through the history. So it's, it's very, it's something that I, I've got in. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy to, to have this conversation with you tonight, Joe, because I think it's very important to, to pass this uh, kind of information to, to your customers. Yeah, absolutely. I think you um, just touched on it there, but the sort of even, you know, what I think what we don't know, like what the general consumer doesn't know far outweighs what we do know to the point where, you know, even tonight I've come in contact with two varieties that I'd never tried before. And, you know, I work at a wine shop and it's, it's almost like, are we, are we only just now scratching the surface of just what, not only Sicily, but some of more of these unknown regions of Italy have to offer in terms of wine cuisine uh you know lifestyle everything like that yo you stayed with me we can discover every single variety <laughs> in every single region don't worry i've got plenty of of, of wine to show you uh, it doesn't sound like a bad life i'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> but no like, like, this is i think i, I did see on your um, i think on your portfolio or your instagram before but i think there's other wines that are from the same producer that might have come through um, that well, I haven't got here in store, but I think it's interesting looking at these two side by side because I feel like you might almost get mistaken for thinking they're from different wineries a little bit 
in terms of the the first being so light and bright and aromatic and you know very acid driven and refreshing and then this this red um the the um pericone yeah. so deep and brooding and dusty and, and rustic and obviously different vintages in that but it's interesting seeing two styles that are d- differ a little bit absolutely and if you mm. It's it's more interesting, you know, taking um, uh, this this conversation along. In in if you're going through, if you if you click into the website from Funaro, you can see that they've got a map of of the, the winery and the vineyards. The vineyards are all one attached to the other in the same in the same spot. So they've got two different uh, sites, uh, Salemi and Santa Ninfa. But the one in in uh, in Santa Ninfa, they all one attached to the other, and the one in in Salemi, they all one attached to the other. But they what they've done, they researched the soil and they planted for the difference in soil, the right varietal. And yes, in in from you know five hectares, six hectares, so it's not a huge uh, piece of land. You can achieve these uh, differences in in uh, in the glass. Yeah, I think it's, it is in showing that that diversity a lot in, um, you said the, the, the microclimates are, to me is, is, is still really fascinating. Um, but no, really, really impressive, I think. And I feel like there's a, yeah, there's a lot more fun to be had with, with Sicilian wine as a whole Absolutely. coming forward. Absolutely. Is that, is that a, is that a, um, still an avenue or a, are there uh, prospects in Sicily that you're sort of got your eye on in terms of bringing in, or you're pretty happy uh, with the producer I, at the moment? I just, uh, you pulled the secrets out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, I just been in, uh, in contact or I've been contact. Uh, so someone uh, sent me an email uh, and touch base with me. Uh, and I've been uh, very happy, nearly overwhelmed that a producer of that caliber could be interested in in me for uh, his uh, distribution here in Australia. Um, it's not it's not set in stone. I say that we are very very close to very close to 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 say yes, we can work together, and this will be an interesting um, new uh, producer for my portfolio, and it will come from the island of Lipari. So a very, very, very small island. So you're talking about the uh, Isole Olie. Uh, Lipari is uh, the only uh, island, the only volcanic island not active anymore. So the, the volcano is, is dead. Um, a lot of uh, pumice, a lot of lava uh, soil, a lot of uh, Ossidiana soil, so practically uh, the layers of the lava washed from the sea. Uh, a lot of interesting wine coming from, from that winery. And the winery has been awarded in the last, uh, yeah, say, 10 years, probably more, uh, from uh, uh, the best judges in, uh, in the world. So talking about French judges, English judges, Italian judges, American judges. Australian judges too. Uh, every single wine has, has been uh, has been uh, awarded with more than 92, 93 points. So quality is very, very high. Uh, I, I think in the in the next couple of weeks I, I will be able to to sign out and sign off whatever you know. Just uh, it will be mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are we are we are on the same um, on the same um, we are working on the same track. So I think would be uh, my my next uh, my next uh, Sicilian coming along. Will will not overlap uh, Funaro. The production is completely different. The the grapes are completely different. So it would be it would be a very good. Uh, and plus they've got a small production in uh, in Vietnam too. Uh, so. With one producer, I can touch base with two different uh, in two different uh, area of of, uh, of Sicily. So that's be, exciting. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to keep um, keep emailing you daily. Absolutely for, uh, for, for <laughs> updates. <laughs> so uh, I've got seven new producers coming on board in the next two months. So 
between Tuscany, between uh, Piedmont, between uh, other area. Um, so the, the portfolio is growing. The portfolio is getting more interesting, more deep. Uh, a lot of different choices coming coming along. Um, I'm touching base in uh, um, with with few producers with and few produce produce. Sorry, into you know biodynamic uh, skin content, orange style, without being uh, you know stinky or too aggressive. Or I like I like to drink wine. I don't like to talk about the wine. I like to drink wine. I like to talk about the wine too, but I prefer to drink it. I, I suppose it's probably worth mentioning as well. If anybody did need to hit you up for any wine um, needs, your Convivian Wine Consultancy. Yes. Right? Yeah. Convivian, Convivian Wine Consultancy is my company. Yes. You can I'll, find it on, on the net. I'll drop it into the, um, the, the Facebook there as well. Um, but yeah, I, I stay, I'm really, really, um, really impressed. And um, I think my interest is, is peaked. I think for every question answered, there's probably about five more that I, I want to keep asking. <laughs> but um, these are awesome. These are really cool. Good. I'm happy that you enjoy. And I, 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 I wish that everyone enjoyed tonight. I think we, um, we introduced to, to your customers uh, uh, three different varieties uh, to a very high level of a, a very high standard level of quality. Yeah, absolutely. No, these will have a these will have a nice spot on the shelves in store, um, so people will know where to get them. Right. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Uh, well, um, I think oh, yeah, we've oh we've actually gone over the hour mark. Wow, Whew, that got away from me. Um, well, Paolo, thanks so much. Um, Thank you, Joe, for having me so again. I was really excited to put this on, and um, it de definitely didn't disappoint. Thanks a lot, and, um, and um, I'll. Uh, I'll, uh, I hope to hear from you very soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll, um, well, maybe we can talk about some, another Italian region. Oh, absolutely. Soon. Keep That'll in touch. Well, yeah, keep in touch. Whatever you, you, you know, you got my folio. So if you want to browse the folio and find something interesting from uh, different areas, I'm happy to, to, to go through with you. Uh, we can maybe do like a tour of Italy, taking one wine from north, one from the center, and one from the south of Italy, and and talk about. Uh, Maybe something that grows on the uh, spine of the Apennine um, uh, mountains that goes along from uh, the top of the north side of Italy to the bottom of Calabria. That'd be amazing. Yeah, uh, we can. We can. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be great fun. I can't wait. <laughs> great. So. Alrighty. And um, yeah, thanks guys as well, everybody in the Zoom chat, everybody on Facebook and YouTube that, that tuned in as well. Um, they're both going to be up there forever, forever and ever and ever. So anyone wants to go back and watch, that's where they'll be as well. Thanks a lot, Joe. Enjoy the rest awesome. of the night. Thanks, Cheers, guys. guys. And drink Italian. <laughs> <laughs>